Hey, writer, if you're ready to level up, then buckle up. Get your pen and paper ready. It's time for another episode of the Art and Business of Writing podcast. Hey guys, welcome back to another edition of the Art and Business of Writing podcast. I'm your host, Chris Jones, where today we celebrate episode 100. You know, one of, this is this is a milestone for me, and I'm grateful that you guys got a chance to be a part of that. Uh, if you don't know what I'm referring to, if you're on my email list, uh, you were given an opportunity to vote for who you wanted to be my 100th guest. And you had a very good slate of potential guests that I've had from the past. And you guys chose Stephanie Heinitz. Uh, Steph Heinitz is a PR professional, a marketing guru, a person who's a former journalist. I guess we can't never call ourselves former journalists. We're always journalists because our nose is always pointed towards news and events and happenings. And Steph has never changed that posture. She is a cheerleader for journalists and she is a definite cheerleader for people who are into marketing and branding and using story to tell their message. And so to that, and I'm excited to bring you Steph Heinitz. Uh, Steph has been a lifelong journalist who cut her teeth uh, working for a local newspaper before graduating on to creating Consociate Media, where she has done a dynamite job of working with business owners, legislative initiatives, economic development programs, nonprofit organization, tourism efforts, and individuals to strategically plan and execute storytelling across a wide range of new and traditional media. So without further ado, here's Steph Heinitz. Hey, Steph, welcome to the show. Hi, Chris. Yeah, it's great to have you back on. You know, first of all, congratulations for being selected by my listeners as the 100th guest. Oh my gosh, I was so excited one that I, I was even, you know, able to be selected and then two when you said I was selected, I was just over the moon. So thank you for the opportunity and yeah. for the to talk to you. I know, I know. I'm telling you man, like PR and marketing is it's it's real. <laughs> it's very real for authors. That, well, for authors, for organizations, for advocacy folks, I mean, for, gosh, for all of us, I've, I've had so many conversations lately when people say, I know I need to do it. I just don't have time. And I'm like, that's the only reason I have a job because other people don't have time and they know they need to do it. So yes, I agree with you 1 million percent. Yeah. And so secondly, I want to congratulate you on your firm being named one of the uh, one of the 2020 best places to work in Virginia by Virginia Business Magazine. What an honor. Like, tell us how that came about and how that feels. Oh, my gosh, Chris, thank you. And thanks for bringing that up. I am. Um, well, you know this about me. My, my background is uh, originally as a journalist and a writer. And when we um, learned that we had placed in, um, in the, as a best place to work, I said to my husband that this felt like better than any award that we could have gotten for the, the work that we actually do. And I said that because, um, because the award was one that you had to earn. It was a Virginia Business Magazine had you fill out all of the different things about your company, which they evaluated. And then everybody that works in your company has to take a survey. So it's actually based on what people think and how they feel about where they work. And it has been um, such a passion of mine to create and cultivate um, a culture and a healthy and creative workplace because we all spend so much time at work and what we do is so much a part of who we are and um, to be recognized that people actually enjoy and feel passion and want to do what they do with us at Consociate Media just I'm rambling uh, but I it just it was a, an honor beyond belief I'm so excited about it Oh, yeah. No, and I think especially it's especially special because, you know, you're a woman owned business as well. Uh, and that's just that, that's a big deal these days, you know. Well, we I we never really think about it that way. Um, we did definitely just, you know, consider us a, a small business. But we did um, just last in December of 2021 marked our 10th anniversary in business. And we celebrated, you know, internally and launched a special fundraiser for an organization that we, you know, we really love quite, quite a bit. And I just remember saying to my business partners that I remember when we celebrated being in business for five years 
And I remember a, a business coach that I had worked with at the time had said, congratulations on getting to five. It's a really small percentage that get to five. It's an even smaller percentage that get to 10. So giddy up. <laughs> and so I <laughs> remember thinking that that felt like uh, being able to get to 10 years as a small business and a woman owned business and a family centered business. Um, and then, you know, being named a, a great place to work. Um, it's just it, it's just been a really really powerfully positive couple of weeks and um just a couple of months ago our video team earned a three telly awards so um so we're entering this new year with some some great accolades uh, for what we do and who we do it with so thanks for bringing that up <laughs> absolutely and what i didn't know though was that consociate media was a million dollar firm i did not know that that's very impressive like when i first met you i think it was around 2013 it was just you and your husband rudy uh tell us how you guys went from like kind of the kitchen table pr to this million dollar startup oh gosh well i mean it 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 literally i mean as you said kitchen table i remember um our first purchase was a laptop i was still working full-time and and rudy who's my husband and also one of my business partners um we didn't have a lot of revenue but we had like this idea that people had really powerful stories to tell and they just needed somebody to help them tell those stories and uh, we started out by helping people write those stories in the form of content marketing for their website or you know, long form captions on social media or press outreach. It was really that storytelling, which was really the heart of the PR of how we started. And we grew because the environment was changing. The environment was, um, you know, how do you tell and show stories in photography and in videography and with the media? And how do you do paid placement? All of that, while it feels very much like advertising and marketing and communications, which it is, it, it is also a form of public relations, which is kind of how we see it. So we grew, um, I think, by one, by by bringing really strong, talented people on the team. I really feel like we we have the best of the best that are that are working on our team, um, and by by staying up on, you know, what the best ways are to 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 story tell because at the end of the day, good PR and good marketing is is all rooted in story, which I think your listeners would really uh, relate to because because they're all writers, so. Yeah, and one story that you and I worked on was that 3D printed house story for Habitat. And I saw that one got picked up by CNN, WTKR here in Virginia, uh, the Independent in the UK, the Grio, a Fox affiliate in San Antonio, Texas, and so many others. Uh, did that blow your mind that, you know, that people would pick that up and just spread it like wildfire? Oh my gosh, Chris, I just have to tell you, uh, when I was thinking about getting the opportunity to talk to you for your podcast, I immediately was thinking about the 3D printed home story and how I have been saying that it is like the perfect case study for the power of good storytelling and the power of really strong PR. Because yes, you are 100% right. It was um, one of the biggest wins, I say win for the organization, Habitat for Humanity, Peninsula and Greater Williamsburg, one of the biggest wins for them from a public relations standpoint from the mass media. It was in CNN and Fox. It was in Southern Living. It was covered by the Washington Post, by Architectural Digest. Um, we've got, uh, NPR covered it. We did pieces for NBC Universal just this week. So it's still getting picked up and the, the amount of local, regional, state, national, and quite frankly, some international press that we got on it was really quite incredible. Um, and we, when looking back at that, we, you know, want to say, okay, how do we replicate that? Because it was just, it was, it, it created a, a great driver of change for the organization. And so we kind of, we, we looked at the whole campaign and for the benefit of your listeners, the background is Habitat for Humanity Peninsula and Greater Williamsburg um, 3D printed a house in Williamsburg. And when they completed it in December of 2021, it became the first completed 3D printed home in the United States, which was a really incredible forward momentum leap for affordable housing. And because it means we can, we can build homes faster, um, more economically, and in a way that is more sustainable for people to live in them. And that's a, all critical things for affordable housing efforts. And when I when we looked at it from the PR side, 
you were starting with an incredible story. Like you have to have a good story and a good why anytime that you're you're trying to get people to to help share something that you're working on. So we started with a foundation of 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 an incredible mission and an incredible story. And from a PR perspective, we put we we put every every piece of um or every tool we had in our toolbox behind helping Habitat tell it. Um, we had video crews um, documenting the entire construction. We had a photographer documenting the entire construction. We wrote stories about the mother and her son who were purchasing the home from Habitat for Humanity. We wrote stories and did documenta- documentation through video and photos of the sponsors and the people who donated materials to build the home. Um, and then we created uh, all of these multimedia ways to engage with the story. So there were there was written content, there was video, there was photo. And what we ended up finding is that people and people read the story, listened to the story, watched the story, and connected with the organization um, and learned about what the organization was doing and the impact of this type of build um, because there was all of these different ways that that we told and showed the story. And that was a real testament. To Habitat for Humanity, um, to have invested so much time and energy, and to have trusted um, us and their team along the way for for how to you know try to get more people aware of what was going on. Wow, no, that's phenomenal. And I want to unpack some of that because you mentioned uh, just how you divided everything into subsets. You know, because one of the one of the skills that I admire about you that you've got in spades is you can like really jam on a press release and you can get people to pick that up. And what I want to talk about next is how important is it for an author to understand their own newsworthiness? Like how how do they figure out, okay, I've got this book I just wrote, it's a great book, it can change lives. How do I find the newsworthy elements to create a press release around it and to build a campaign around that? Oh goodness, I, I I still think it's very um, foundational, uh, and and I think I think authors would um, really relate to this in terms of uh, you know the the elements that they're using to craft their own story. Um, but when when you're when you're trying to figure out what your newsworthiness is, um, I always encourage uh, our clients, which which we've worked with some authors in the past. Um, one, what why is what you're saying or what you have to say or what you're releasing why should should people care? Like, what is the story behind it? Because I think that in some cases, even just the 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 why you're you're writing something or releasing your book, I think can be a draw. Um, if you can then couple your why with um, some statistics or some sort of greater mission, I think that that can also help you know identify what your your news hook is. Um, and then I, I think if you can connect it with um, something that's timely, some current event, um, and a current event could be something that's you know happening politically, or is happening. It's a holiday, um, or something that's you know you know news that's happening in 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 the world. Um, I think that's one of the ways. Uh, or those are three of the really core ways to try to identify what the newsworthiness is. I think, unfortunately, while I consider myself a, a pretty voracious reader and and I try to follow you know things that are coming out I think just the fact that a book is being released or an author is you know dropping something um, doesn't necessarily make it newsworthy by itself I mean that's the same for businesses just because you're launching a new product doesn't make that newsworthy why are you launching that new product what is that new product what difference could that product make and asking those same questions when you're talking about promoting yourself or promoting your book um, and and then again, like sort of thinking about those, you know, the three legged stool, what, you know, why is it newsworthy? What's the why? Um, how does it fit into current events? Um, and then, you know, are there some statistics? Like, can you can you put some numbers and metrics behind it? Um, I think those three things can really help you sort of uncover um, what your what your newsworthiness is. Um, and actually, Chris, one of the things I was thinking about and in, in getting ready to chat with you today was a was a colleague and fellow friend that you and I have, Natalie Miller Moore, who's a, a writer and also a PR strategist. And I remember years ago being really struck by something she said, and that PR folks tend to to look at you know 
at, at whatever they're trying to help promote or get news coverage of um, as like a treasure hunt and like finding that news nugget or that it, it's like finding like the, the pot of gold or the treasure chest. And I think a lot of times, whether it's an author or a business owner, they can't see what their treasure is. So one of the pieces of advice, and I inspired by that, what, which Natalie had said to me years ago, um, is I encourage people to ask others what they're struck by, because often you can't see it yourself. And so that's sometimes the value a PR firm can bring is that they can see something that you don't, but ask your friends or ask, you know, the people who are doing the test read of your book or ask your editor. Um, that's another way I think that you can really work to uncover the newsworthiness or the hook of, of, of why you're trying to pitch something to the media. Good gracious. That was a whole roundabout answer to your question. <laughs> no, it was, it was perfect. It was exactly what I was looking for, exactly what I'd hope you'd say. And it, it's, and it's very, very succinct. And, and to, to that, I want to ask you in terms of dialing in the audience, because of course, you know, you can have all this great stuff like the why and the how and the what, but if you're pitching it to the wrong people, it doesn't really matter. Uh, so how, how does a person go about understanding you know, where to find their audience and then moving towards that position? Well, I think first and foremost, um, ask yourself, what is the per the person that you want to read your book? And this would be specific to authors. What are they reading? And and then also the topic of your book, where does that align? Um, I think in, in when we're promoting, um, you know, advocacy organizations or businesses or individuals. Those are some of the things that we look at first. Um, and, uh, you know, using the Habitat for Humanity example that we were we were just chatting about, um, Architectural Digest picked that up and wrote about that from the perspective of, you know, architectural trends. Southern Living picked it up and wrote about it from the, the perspective of design trends. Uh, Washington Post picked it up and wrote about it from the perspective of affordable housing and technology trends. So I think that if you can, and, and those are three very different uh, news outlets. You've got a very trade specific architectural digest. You've got a lifestyle feature specific in Southern Living. And then you've got very news with Washington Post. And, and if you could, if you looked at the, the way they wrote about the same story, it was, it was tailored to the folks that are reading those, those publications, same with TV or radio or, you know, bloggers, social influencers, um, which I'm going to cross my fingers because I want to make sure I make a point about social influencers <laughs> before I forget later. Um, but I think when, you, when you're talking about how do you identify which publications or outlets to target, um, you really want to look at um, how they would write about or cover you, what your audience is reading, and, and how your topic aligns. Um, and, and I would also, and I think you can relate to this, Chris, I would also encourage people to look at freelance writers. Uh, I think the trends and specifically print media have changed so much over the, the last few years, um, as newsrooms have really dwindled the size of their staff, that you have a lot of freelance journalists out there that are looking for interesting stories to pitch to magazines, to pitch to newspapers. And if you can get linked in with them and have them help pitch for you, um, that could be a way to leverage uh, what, what you're trying to get out there. Ooh, those are great tips. And I want to ask uh, right behind that is, so how does someone list build? How do you create that media list so that when you are ready to pitch, you know who to pitch it to and where to send your queries? I'll be super honest, Chris. There are a ton of software, like, offerings out there where they're like, just do a quick query on who's writing about what. And it'll pull, like, you can pay for this. Honestly, in, in our company, and I know everybody does it differently, we do it by hand. Um, we develop key media databases based on who we're working for and what we're pitching. And the reason that we've started doing that is because one, the the landscape of media is changing so much and so quickly. Um, it, you know, one day you've got a business writer at you know a statewide publication, um, and then the next day they're they're freelancing or they're working somewhere else. So it it when you're when you're trying to list build, um, we do it do it you know really um, we customize it for what we're we're doing. We're not doing anything 
um, like pay to play or not buying lists. That so that's number one. So when when the first piece of advice we would give folks is if you're trying to get a bunch of coverage and I'm in Virginia, so I'll say Virginia, um, we'll go out and build a database of who's currently at the Richmond Times Dispatch, who's currently at the local Scoop magazine, who's currently at Virginia magazine or whatever the publications are, who's currently reporting on, you know, feature type stories in between breaking news at the local NBC affiliate. Um, and then we'll, we'll build it based on that. Once we establish those relationships for that organization or the relationships that we have ongoing as a, as a firm, um, we continue to pitch specifically to folks, um, you know, that's beyond just like sending out to a database. Um, so, so it's really, for us, it's really personalized, but I will say if you don't have the time to do that, there are, there are tools out there that you can sort of register for, you can buy a subscription to, that can help you develop lists a little bit more quickly. The last piece um, that, that we've often utilized is social media. Um, I have found, and I don't even know if, I, if this was something we talked about the last time we were on a podcast together, but we have found that um, sending direct messages to journalists through Twitter, through Facebook, through Instagram um, is incredibly um, beneficial. And we often find that we're getting requests for things from journalists through those social media channels. So I always say never rule those out either. Um, so when we build, when we do list building now, we're list building email addresses and phone numbers, even though nobody answers the phone anymore. Um, and we're doing social media handles. So our lists are becoming a little bit more diverse as we custom build them for what we're working on. Oh, yeah, I definitely agree with the social media DMs. I, I use those all the time. A hundred percent. All the time. Because people are always on their phone. And what do they say? Market to the phone. That's what you do. You market to the phone. Absolutely. But not the calling phone. Yes, yes. Do not call me. I know. <laughs> do not call me. I will not pick up. <laughs> I, was, um, I was crossing my fingers earlier because I wanted to make sure I remembered to bring up the idea of social influencers, which is something that we've been, from a marketing standpoint, we've definitely been doing a lot more work in that space. And that's where you have, you know, we'll use Instagram as the example, but you've got somebody on Instagram that's got 40,000 followers and they can sort of sponsor or endorse um, your product, your book, your mission um, for, for a fee. So, you know, it's sponsored content advertising for lack of a better word, but there are still a lot of social influencers that'll do that because they've read your book and they really want to tell people about it. Um, so I, I would never discount, we think about traditional media when we're talking about PR in so many instances, newspapers, radio, bloggers, which is that hybrid between traditional mass media and social influencers. But we also are looking at who's got, who's got an audience bigger than, you know, the Washington Post on Instagram or TikTok, and can we possibly get them to do some earned media in that social space? So um, that's definitely an area that is is becoming more hybrid for marketing and PR purposes, I think. And so let's let's walk it back a little bit because I want to go back to where we talked about you know reaching out to media. What do you recommend in terms of best practices for writing out that query. Like, you know, I've got a book, I, I know my newsworthiness, I'm ready to pitch a journalist. What do I say in that email? Well, from a tactical standpoint, um, and gosh, Chris, I, I, send you, I have sent you press releases over the years, so I certainly hope I'm practicing what I preach. Um, but from a tactical standpoint, uh, we definitely recommend putting things in email, not adding a lot of attachments to things because people don't open attachments very easily um, or very quickly. We're, we're sort of trained in this cyber warfare world that attachments from somebody you don't know could be bad or links could be bad. Um, so when it comes to like doing a query, there's really two approaches via email that we've taken. And that's a traditional press release where you're really formally announcing something where you have a headline and a dateline and there's a, it, a press release that reads like it's something that you could pick up, you know, on an online or in print publication. Um, but then the other is a, really a personal outreach email um, to reporters. Hey, 
I've noticed that you've been covering affordable housing and they've got this really great story. Would love to chat with you about it. Would love to set up an interview if it's something that that you'd be interested in. Connecting with journalists uh, when you're querying them on uh, on a level that relates to stuff that they're working on or that they've written or you know produced, I think is really a, a good tactic um, in personalizing that outreach. Now that takes a little bit more time and takes a little bit more elbow grease, um, but we find that it is often, um, especially when you're talking about a, a smaller pitch. I mean, because not every day you have, you know, the first three D printed home, you know, completing in the United States. I mean, that all alone by itself is newsworthy. Um, but when you have something that's a little bit more um, subtle, but still newsworthy, having that really personalized approach can be, like I said, really beneficial. Yeah. And, and you touched on social a little bit. Um, your social, the DMs can be a lot less formal though, right? Absolutely. Um, and, and, and I think also when you start developing relationships with journalists, I mean, I, I have legitimately sent Facebook messages that say like, yo, Dave, hey, I've got an idea. I want to run it by you. Can I give you a shout later this afternoon? Like, I mean, once you develop those relationships, it's definitely more more personal. Um, but but yes, I have been known to send an email and then in you know a DM Send a, hey, sent you something over email. I have a story idea I want to run by you based on some stuff you're working on. Would love to connect. Because I think I think at the end of the day, your communication has to be true to the, the medium by which you are communicating. You're not expecting a full-blown press release in an instant message, but you would be maybe in a in an email. You're not going to expect that whole thing copy and pasted in a text message, um, but but you might in another form. So I think as you said, when you're using, you know, DM and social media to, to connect with journalists, remember that the meet the platform that you're, that you're communicating on. And that is, that is more informal. All right. And with press releases, you talk, you mentioned putting those in the body of the email. Uh, how, how, how important is it for a, a, an author to have a press release? Is it, is it, a, is it highly important? Is it encouraged? Is it really beneficial? So I think it all for us, um, the guidance that we would give it is all, it all goes back to your resources. Um, so if you have the resources and the time to put out a press release, and I would say absolutely, um, because you can, you can send that out. It gives you sort of a, a, a polished feel. It, it, it helps, um, legitimize what you're releasing, I think. Um, if you are doing that, I definitely recommend that you do it the quote unquote right way. Make sure your press release is grammatically correct, easy to say to authors. Make sure it is written in AP style, so that's associated press style, so that it it reads in the language by which journalists um, write or produce things. Um, but that also being said, in today's world, um, an email pitch or a social media pitch, as you you know, we were just talking about with direct messages, I think is fine too. Um, so, but that really just depends on how much time and how many resources do you have to put, put towards it. Right. And how important is crafting a really good subject line? Like, how do you get them to open it? Oh, that, yes, that is, that is, well, for emails, that is critically important. Um, we actually utilize, uh, and there's a ton of free tools out there, um, that you can, that you can use like MailChimp or, um, you know, other email marketing tools, um, that will help guide you on what are words that are more likely to get to spam or what are words in a subject line that are more likely to get opened. Um, but you definitely look at the subject line as catching attention. I know we all get a ton of emails. Um, so you definitely want to make sure that, that your subject line is catching folks and also say, Chris, and my apologies for not saying this earlier, we're talking about press outreach from the standpoint of written press releases. Um, and, and I, I fully admit that I, I go toward that as my go-to, um, being a, a writer by trade, but the reality is, is there's also video news release opportunities. There's audio news release opportunities because you are also pitching to um, TV and to radio and to podcasters. Um, so there's there's a lot of different ways that you can put together a pitch that is even beyond a, a written press release. 
All right, great. Now, we've talked a lot about publicity and kind of getting yourself out there. Can you give us a working definition of the difference between publicity and marketing? Oh, I should have asked for that question ahead of time. That's a good one. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I feel like people use it very interchangeably, and it's not the, not a bad thing, but it's not exactly correct either, right? Yeah, I... I that's probably, I mean, by the true definition, that that's definitely a, an accurate statement. But, and this is this may not be uh, something that is that is widely uh, believed like we do. But I believe marketing is a form of public relations. I feel like marketing is a form of publicity. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I think they all work hand in hand, which is which is why we kind of lump the work that we do as overall into communications. Um, but, but I think when you're talking about publicity, you're really looking at how do I get earned media? How do I get other people to talk about me? And that's what publicity is about. When you're talking about marketing, in, in my estimation, you're talking about how do I get people to pay attention to me and then do what I'm asking them to do, buy my book, buy my product, listen to my message. Um, so if, if I were to have to define it, I, I would put publicity in that category of how do I get other people to talk about what I'm doing and marketing of how do I talk about what I'm doing and get other people to pay attention to it. Ooh, I love that. That's great. <laughs> that was off the cuff. So that was like straight gut, Chris. <laughs> yeah, you need to write that down and put it somewhere. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to listen to the recording later. <laughs> <laughs> and so with that little bit of a backpedal, here we are in 2022, right? We've got video, we've got audio rooms like Clubhouse, you've got podcasts, social media, websites, television. I mean, the list goes on and on. What's your advice for an author who's trying to develop a platform, like a marketing platform to put their book on or to build around themselves? Well, I, I mean, I still think number one, um, well, actually, let me back up. No matter what your resources are, there are like, it, we've come like light years of how you can promote and market yourself. I'm going to start using your two words, publicity, promotion, and, and marketing, <laughs> um, because there's, you can do it so, so efficiently and effectively, and it doesn't always have to be expensive. So I always say, I still say your website needs to be your mothership. So if you're getting ready to launch a book, I, you, I, I really believe you need to have a website. That website is where you're driving people to, whether it's to go purchase on Amazon or download the audio file or whatever it is that is the action you want them to take. You've got to have like a core place you're sending them to. Um, then if you're doing social media to drive them, then they drive back to that mothership. If you're doing publicity, earned media, PR, then you're asking reporters to, to, to write about you, to produce about you, and you've got to have a place to send them back to to take action. So first and foremost, make sure that you have a strong web presence. And you know, when I first said that there's there's so many more options today, there's you can obviously hire a firm to do that, but there's also, you know, what's called WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get. These, you know, do-it-yourself builders that look so sexy now. You can go to Shopify or Wix or Squarespace and really, really build a really powerful place. And and I would always say just build out from there. Um, a lot of these sites, you can then embed audio stuff. If you're doing videos, you can embed video components. Um, all of those other things can can be the spinoffs from from that core mothership. Okay. And so one thing about your firm is that you really use story as the driving vehicle for your marketing and promotion. How can authors do the same? Oh, gosh. Well, I mean... If I were sitting down with an author and and we were we were talking about them getting ready to either launch a book or um, what they're you know what they're doing, I would immediately ask about their story. Like, how did they get there? Like, what's their why? What drove them? What's the background of the book? What are the stories behind that? Um, and, and and really, that's just a a way of uncovering how do we connect with what what you what you were doing and what you did with other folks. Um, and, and I still, I think that it's, it, I mean, it feel like in today's age, it feels so cliche, but it's so true, Chris, 
we connect over story. I mean, and if anybody understands that, it's authors. I mean, you're investing so many, so much time and your passion and creativity and in, in telling and in, in, in telling story. But when, you know, when you go home and you're telling your grandmother about what you did, you know, that week at work, you're going to tell her a story. You're not going to give her stats. Um, when you want somebody to understand the impact of a decision that's made, you know, on Capitol Hill, you're going to tell them a story about, the person it impacted, as well as talk about, you know, the advocacy or the legislative side of it. it stories impact change. They impact, they connect us. Um, and I think that's true, very true for, for authors who are trying to, to, to connect with people through their own words. That was a little rambly. I apologize, but. <laughs> no, no, that's good because, you know, like you'd mentioned just the idea of using story because story like you know the behind the scenes stuff that you do or the stuff that you do on site i mean i think authors can totally take advantage of that by showing their behind the scenes lives or showing themselves you know in the process or showing their galleys i mean just finding ways to keep readers engaged in what they're doing along the way as part of the process so that readers feel more invested in what they're doing oh my gosh yeah that's that was a a, a great hook back chris because that that documenting what you're doing and how you're doing it that alone is part of the story um, I think that in today's media world, um, story can be so segmented. Like you, you post something on you know your Instagram feed today, and it's just you know one element of it. And then ten days later, you've made ten other posts, and now you have a more complete sort of picture. But that's how we're that's how we're consuming information today in little bits and pieces. And we're reading books, and we're watching documentaries, and we're reading the newspaper. Um, so it's it, as you just said, all of those pieces make up make up parts of the story, and they don't all have to be released at the same time. I think that's another component to it. Yeah, so it's almost like a, a reverse engineering of the process because you know writing is all about uh, show me, don't tell me, and then marketing the marketing side is all about tell me without, you know, I mean, sorry, the marketing side is, you know, show it to me. I, you know, oh, I just mixed that up. Sorry. I just, <laughs> I mixed that up. Writing is a lot about, you know, you know, when, you get, when you're dealing with writing, it's show, don't tell. So we're, we're in the details. We're writing the story. We're trying to show the story without telling you what's going on. Whereas marketing is the other, other side. We're telling you, here's what's happening and showing you at the same time. So it's kind of a, a, a symbiotic relationship between those two, but whereas writing is a little different, I think writers can get trapped in the whole thing of, I need to tell you without showing you, and we need to be more present. And I feel like authors don't get that part about being fully present. We, we've got this entire life where we're behind the screen, behind the computer, behind the scenes, but we really need to be more forth, you know, forthcoming with our stuff as we develop, if that makes sense. Oh, for sure. It's that connection. Like, I, I think that we, we all want to connect with whatever we're consuming, whether it's, you know, f fiction or nonfiction or, um, and being able to connect with the, the person that produces it really strengthens that. I think that relationship that, that an author would have with, with a reader. Um, I know I feel that way for the, for the content that I consume. Um, my, my, my late, one of my latest ones is I'm completely obsessed with Mel Robbins and her high five habit. And, um, she's a, I mean, self-help feels like an overused term, but she, she very much is in that space of like, how do I sort of coach you life coach into to positivity in your life? And she released this book about the high five habit, which was literally giving yourself a high five in the mirror. And I found myself following her more uh, after reading her book, following her more on Instagram so I could connect more with how she was practicing what she was preaching in her book. It wasn't about anything that I hadn't already read. It was about connecting more with her as an author. Oh yeah, Mel's phenomenal. I didn't realize until back at the end of the summer, I was listening to a podcast. Can't remember which one I was listening to, but Mel's first book, which I do have, um, that's the uh, five minute rule, five second rule, sorry, five second rule. Um, I that, you one. Yeah, that <laughs> book was self-published. She did that all by herself with no she, publisher and blew it out. She's brilliant. And then when I remember listening, and I think it was probably in the High Five Habit that she talks about the backstory to that and how it was on Audible first. Or yes. I, something like that. But it was completely non-traditional and 
that would that really showed you just how multimedia our world is for the way we consume information. Yeah, yeah. She had mentioned that she was, you know, on Amazon. She had the the paperback book, and she realized that she was having issues with the logistics of it, where they kept saying that they only had like five copies left. She's like, there's no way they only have five copies left. And she was getting frustrated with the whole process of Amazon and her book not moving. And she's thinking that she's a failed author. And then she opens up her Audible and has like a million downloads and Audible and becomes like the best selling author in Audible that year. So it also goes to show that, you know, for authors, it's very wise to diversify, you know, your, your catalog. Oh, Chris, I'm so grateful for this conversation because I'm going to remember to talk more about that Mel Robbins example when I talk with friends and clients, because you're totally right. She's a great case study for thinking a little bit differently and recognizing that sometimes the things that don't work out are for a reason. Yeah. And so uh, speaking of diversifying, you know, earlier, you know, you had talked about the 3D story pitch, like, you know, how it was tailored for various magazines and their audiences. With social media the way it is, should should authors tailor their content to specific audiences within that type of social media? Because the, the typical Facebook user isn't the same as the Twitter user, who isn't the same as the Pinterest user, who isn't the same as the Instagram user. So the short answer is, is, is yes. I mean, I, I think that the way you would present information uh, it just goes back to the way we were talking about when you pitch to journalists that you're, the way you do it in an email could be different than in a direct message. Um, it, it, but it also, the caveat is resources. So if you have the resources and the time, absolutely. What you say on Facebook should be slightly different than what you put on Instagram, which is definitely going to be different than what's on stories or what you put on LinkedIn. That being said, and I do this myself, sometimes you want to make sure you get out on all those platforms. So you do something that's a little more general and it goes out on all of them at the same, you know, not at the same time, but, you know, very similar content. It's the same picture. Maybe the caption is tweaked or something like that. Um, so I think in, in the best case scenario, you are curating custom content for the channels that you're, that you're on. But if you can't do that, then it, that's okay too. Just be aware that there are different audiences on those different channels. Okay. Now let's talk about an author that I know you love, Gary Vaynerchuk. All right. <laughs> you love Gary Vaynerchuk. <laughs> now, I, now I know you're a disciple of his jab, 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 right hook method. Can you explain what that is, how it works, and why it works? Yeah. The. I mean, I think the my partner Michael Kimball, who I know you know, Chris. Um, he has the best way of really summarizing that that hit Gary Vaynerchuk's approach, that jab, 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 right hook. And really it's give people things that are of value to them without any expectation of anything in return. And then when you ask them for something, they're more likely to want to do something for you or do what you've asked them to do. So jab, 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 uh, it, you know, is, you know, I'm not a boxer, so I can't like speak the athletic side of this, but, um, you know, give people, don't always be asking for things. Don't always be throwing that right hook to knock somebody out and get them to do what you're, you know, force them to do something. Give people information, educate folks, entertain folks because that you want to connect with them with no expectation of return. Don't always be like asking for people to buy your book or book you for a speaking event. Just tell them something interesting, give them an excerpt, um, give them some information that you've learned along the way, give them some advice. And then maybe every four or five times you're posting on social media, then ask them to buy your book or download your white paper or book you for an event. I hope that was, if Gary Vaynerchuk is listening to your podcast, I hope that was a good way of representing <laughs> what we've learned from, from his message there. No, that's exactly right. And you, you actually touched on what my next question would have been is, you know, how much of an author's marketing uh, should be educating and nurturing their audience versus constantly selling them? Because one thing I do see a lot, particularly on Twitter, I'm on Twitter a lot. And one thing I do see is just this constant link bombing. It's almost like scorched earth marketing where it's like, OK, daisy cutters are coming out. We're driving the planes over and we're just going to bomb you with links to kingdom come. And then if there's anything left standing, we're going to send another round of links out and somebody's going to buy the book eventually. It's almost that that thing of, uh, you know, that old saying, if you're trying to sell to everybody, you sell to nobody. And I don't think people firmly grasp that you can't just sell to everybody. Everybody's not your audience. So what's the what's that ratio? What do you think that ratio is? 
Well, I mean, if you if you use Gary V, it's sort of like that four to one or, you know, for every four, every time after four posts, do something that's the, the ask for the fifth thing. Um, I, I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't know if you say 75% or, you know, what that act, that percentage or that ratio would be. I just know that people are not dumb. And they're not on social media. If we're talking social media in particular, they're not on social media to be sold. They're on social media to be social and to be entertained. And if you overdo the selling, then they're going to tune you out. So make a, use social media to be social and to make a connection with folks. And the way you do that is one, by being authentic and two, by, you know, sharing and giving of things without an expectation of return. Um, so that when you do ask for something, they're more likely to hear you and, and pay attention. Um, I, I'll use Mel Robbins as another example. Cause I, like I said, I consume her social media content and have consumed her long form written content um, or more, more likely of audible content. But I love the little pieces of life advice she gives on Instagram every day. Like these little reminders of you are enough or did you high five yourself or, you know, whatever it is that she puts out there. She's not asking me to buy her book. She's just telling me, giving me a, a positive reminder of a way to carry myself through the day but she sticks with me and I did end up buying her book. Um, so I think that, that that's a good example of, of that sort of give without the expectation of return. Um, and then when you do ask for something, people are more likely to hear you. Yeah. Yeah. It, it reminds me a lot of basketball. Like I used to coach basketball for a number of years. And one thing I, one of the things I used to teach the boys was you have to learn how to play without the ball, you know, learn how to move around the court, how to interact with the defensive players. If you're on offense, learn how to figure out ways to get open. But it's, and I think a, a lot of social selling is like that. You have to learn to sell without selling. Yeah. And I think that, you know, Chris, when you talk, when we talk about the power of story, um, I think that that's, that's, uh, you know, why we do so much of that. And, and maybe that's never really thought about it this way, but giving, you know, telling a story is like giving somebody something. It's giving them advice or knowledge or, something to relate to or a connection. Um, and you're not, you're not asking for anything back. You're, you're just giving of a story of, of something. Um, and maybe that's, maybe that's part of it. Yeah, I, I definitely think so. I think story, you know, as we talk about has gone, it just goes a long way. It's one of the oldest ways that we connected with each other from the very beginning of time. It's just been story, whether it's writing on walls in the cave or it's oral traditions that get passed down, like story just works for people. It just resonates. People want, to hear story. And if we can find ways as authors to deliver that to them, whether in traditional media, like we talked about, or whether on social media, I think it, it creates a win-win because people do gravitate towards that. They do go to the social platforms because they want the stories. They want to find out what's going on and they want to see what's going on in your life, or they want to find something witty or funny or cheeky. Well, in, in the, in the, theme of of your audience of authors of the folks that you work the most closely with it, it is their story as an author their story as a person that is what is what i would be most interested in and what i would want to pull out if i was working with an author how you got there what you're doing to keep going your process as you said behind the scenes chris i loved and i i'm totally calling you out because i'm pretty sure i saw this on your wife's facebook page but how you redid or how she redid a closet in your house to be your office like so you had a private room to go to and i loved seeing that because i was like oh that's so relatable that's like the behind the scenes of chris like i felt <laughs> so much more connection to you from seeing that and that had nothing to do with you as a writer or an editor or an entrepreneur that I greatly respect. It had everything to do with what was happening in your home behind the scenes. And that's the thing that I have in my head, although I, I do consume your content. So I know you have other really great content, but um, that's what pops up to me first is that that personal behind the scenes thing that I saw, not necessarily the latest book that you edited, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. No, it's just the whole show your personality, like just be who you are and let people see the real person behind the work. I was uh, I was thinking about that recently 
um, because I will fully admit it, it, it's like the cobbler's children. One of the best stories ever. Like you're so busy fixing other people's shoes that your kids are running around barefoot. I, with my own social presence, am very much like a cobbler's child. So if you you look for Steph Heinitz, um, you don't see as much um, of the work or the the things that I'm doing. But you know, I was looking at my feed recently, and I was like, well, apparently what I do is I spend a lot of time with my dogs and my kid, and I run. Like that. <laughs> that is my social feed. I was like, I'm pretty sure there's more to Stephanie than that. But, um, but that's what I mean, I think that's probably, you know, in truth, that's probably what people will remember or connect with more. Yeah, I totally agree. Like whenever I follow an influencer, or anyone with a blue check, it's always like, I like seeing what they do in their free time. So I think it's a great lesson to learn. Well, I can't wait to see your office closet. Yeah, I'll just send it to you. <laughs> send it to you. <laughs> it's fantastic. I uh, It's something I, I just kept walking past this closet one day and I was like, I think I could fit an office in there. That's plenty of room for him. Like the minimalist dude that I am, I could fit all my entire life in this closet. And so I just set about to put things in order and here we are. And it works out very well. Oh my gosh. When I saw it, I was like, kudos. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's not very big. It's not even super big. It's like a like a broom closet almost, but it, it fits everything in there. And I'm like, this is this is super. And it's funny because like you know, my wife made fun of it for a while. I was like, oh, your little closet up. It's ha ha ha. You know, my kids did too. And then they came in here and started hanging out because it was quiet. And I was like, see, told you. You know, you just said a word that triggered um, a, a, an organization that I also consume a lot of, and that's the minimalists. And my Rudy and I live in a, a, a very modest home. Um, and we have a lot of like areas that are like, okay, how can we put a lot in a little space? Um, but I, I love the minimalist and they had a doc, they've had two documentaries. Now they have a website. I'm pretty sure they have a book. Um, but I consume a lot of their content and especially their podcast. And it, they are the embodiment of, we give you information without the expectation of a lot in return. I mean, they don't even have ads on their podcast um, because for that, I think for that very reason. Um, but that, that when you were talking about, you know, as a minimalist guy, that that's another, another group of writers that I, I think are a great example of somebody doing it right. Awesome. So closing out, what, what's a, a few pieces of advice that you would give authors for, just understanding their publicity, getting out there, not being afraid to to share their work? Well, I think that I would put it some some into two buckets. There's sort of like the philosophical advice, and then there's some like real tactical stuff. Uh, on the philosophical side, I think the summary of really what we've been talking about today, you know, one, people are interested in you and your story, and don't be afraid to tell and show that. Um, and, 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 and that part of who you are is what's creating your art or your whatever you're publishing. And people are going to be interested in that as well. Um, I think that second piece of, you know, don't feel like you're always selling, give without the expectation of return. Um, that will be how you connect with people. And in the way you can give is through, diff is, is through story and education. From a tactical standpoint, um, I think very much that authors should could, should have a strong website. I think if they're looking at look, getting strong publicity on that website, have a media page. And on that media page, have your bio, have a downloadable headshot, have a, if you can do this, have a give video news release that's downloadable B-roll for TV stations to use, have a downloadable audio file that are some sound bites and clips of you talking about your work. Make it really, really easy for journalists to be able to write, publish, show, tell things about you. Um, and then I, I think from a practical standpoint, um, journalists are, if you're looking at that publicity side, because I think you can get lots of guidance online about marketing and how to do social marketing, but that publicity side and working with PR and with journalists they are working fast and you are working on their deadline. So if somebody reaches out to you 
return their call, return their text, return their, their direct message. Um, we've seen lots of times that people will say, well, I can't get to that reporter this week. Um, I'll call them back next week. And we'll say, that's actually not the way it works. You need to call them back sooner than later, or they might move on to another story. So invest in a, in a website, whether it's through time of getting doing one yourself or having somebody do it and use that as your mothership to drive everything else too. Um, and then have a media page to make things really easy for journalists that are looking to, to give you some publicity. Um, and, and then be really responsive to them when they express interest in, in what you're doing, whether you've asked them to pay attention to you or they've reached out to you because they've heard about you in some other way. I could go on and on, but I would say those are some top ones. Woo, that's fantastic. Now, that's great. That's great. Great way to end it. And uh, just grateful to have you on. Like I said, grateful to have you as the 100th guest. You definitely showed that you were the right choice. Oh, gosh, Chris. I'm so I, I'm such a huge fan of yours. And I, I, I'm so grateful for the friendship that we've had over the years. And I know we don't see each other often, but... I, I just, I always know that you're a great colleague and, and mentor in the corner for all of us creatives out here. So thank you so much for your friendship over the many years. Oh, likewise. Thank you so much, Steph. How's that for inspiring? I hope you take action on one thing you learned in today's episode. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast and left a review on iTunes, I want to encourage you to do that too. Finally, be sure to visit chrisjonesinc.com to sign up for updates. Don't worry, I won't spam you. And we'll see you back here next week for another episode.